Good morning, everybody. Uh, I have to say you're missing five other excellent talks, so thanks for coming for my talk. This is a very heavily battled slot at the moment. Hi, so I'm Christian Hymas. I'm going to talk to you about profiling and tracing with different tooling. And uh, one reason why I started to look into the topic was well, an issue I faced a couple of years ago that, well, their systems were like every five minutes there was a like a blocking. It, the whole system didn't respond for a couple of seconds and we couldn't figure that out for a long time and boss was kind of like, yeah, angry because we lost a bit of money. That's really annoying. And uh, with the tooling I will show you, you can actually figure that out. In a similar talk we had yesterday, which I missed while I was giving a, another talk with Steve Dower, what, by uh, Christoph Hare, who looked into why is, um, so is it a problem with the gill or a problem with me because the system is not responding? And one of the final um, motivations for this talk is something when I ported this talk for originally a talk at a general web developer conference with examples in Python and PHP to pure Python using requests, figured out there's a big block, like almost 30% wasting on something very, very interesting. Uh, so this is a flame graph of a uh, request call. Um, at the end, we'll see what that thing actually is, this block, and why you should use request.session if you do a lot of requests in a loop. An alternative title for this talk is also uh, actually two and a half use cases for tracing tools because you can, only, you can use the tracing tools not only for debugging and profiling, there's also something very cool for anybody working in quality engineering or testing, which I will show later on. I learned that just half a year ago at another conference. So, who am I? Hi. I'm from Hamburg, a Python core developer using Python for 18 years almost now. Uh, working mostly in security in Python, and um, I'm making money by working for Red Hat on security engineering, a software stack called Free IPA. So, agenda and goals for this talk is to explain what this picture is all about. So, this is a not all a big fraction of different profiling and tracing and performance investigation tools for Linux for different kinds of the stack down from what the CPU is doing on a very, very low level to very, very high level what the um, application is doing. After a short introduction, I will introduce you to user space tracing tools based on the ptrace syscall, and the second half will be about kernel tracing and hardware tracing tools that can go down to the very, very low level. Uh, summary, and I may have, I don't think, maybe five minutes of question and answers. Some special thanks. So, uh, a lot of these demos I'm going to show are uh, based on tooling and blog posts by Brandon Gregg. So, if you're interested in profiling and tracing, go to Brandon Gregg's website. He's fantastic. Uh, Victor Stinner also uh, has been investing lots of time to optimize Python and has some very helpful explanations how to do proper benchmarking because benchmarking is super hard and super uh, hard to get correct. Uh, Dimitri Levin, I met him, the maintainer of S-Trace uh, at a conference a while ago. Uh, I learned some of the cool new tricks, and another engineer, Red Hat, showed me another couple of tricks uh, for tracing for system engineers. So this is a combination of some talks I saw before, some tooling I've been using for a while, and yeah. Introduction. So some terminology, most people uh, think of debugging as like identifying, like removing bugs, which is usually if you do debugging as an engineer, it's very costly because you have to invest a time. You can't do that easily on a production system because you slow down the production system a lot, so you need to build your, like, your additional fake production system or your staging system at data, and you can't actually do much of the same things because you don't see kind of traffic patterns. So there's a better thing, it's tracing. Uh, which I will show here, is more like observing, monitoring. If you do it the right way, that's why there's a small star and you're fast, it doesn't slow down your production system much. It's still a small impact, but it's mostly okay and better than having big performance issue in production. And once you do tracing and get data, as a byproduct, you can also do some kind of profiling and data analysis and visualization of what's going wrong. Uh, methodology, 
So there are different kinds of tracing. Uh, the simple part you may know is like application level tracing. You build a debug build, you have some kind of tooling that writes log files somewhere like uh, MySQL slow query. Uh, Python had a high level so set trace call. You can edit callback that gets called when something is going on, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are also more uh, user space tracing that go a bit deeper, like on the C level. You can load something into your process space with all the preload. You can use, use P tracing. Uh, even deeper is kernel uh, space tracing, which uses the kernel to investigate what the operating system is doing on a lower level or how user space communicates with kernel space and hardware. And finally, there's actual hardware tracing. So any modern CPUs had special capabilities to do hardware performance counting, uh, power management unit controls. You can see what different health cache levels and just things in your computer actually do. To do tracing, you often have to do some special steps. You have to uh, install some tooling. Often you need special permissions. So you can't do tr uh, some of the tracing as a user and sometimes not even as an admin. So you have to disable some protections like you have to disable secure boot to inject kernel models because low level tracing is often like live patching your kernel, which is a bit scary, but also very cool. Just write stuff that runs in a kernel, unlimited, accessing all hardware, yeah. But to do tracing, profiling, understanding what's going on, a big issue is statistics are very hard. So you should at least know a bit of statistics. And uh, you may know the first uh, phrase. The second one is German for who measures, measures fertilizer. So just to, or manure. So uh, to understand statistics, just some things, if you're interested in that, you should learn about as different kinds, so what's different between average, mean, and for profiling, often very useful to get the percentile. So uh, how good are 95% of all requests, or 99%? Because you don't often care that much of, about outliers, or you want to specifically know when there is a big outlier. Uh, there are different kinds of errors. You can have like ob observational errors, you can have random errors that modify your output. Uh, there are also kind of biases. So if you're looking very hard at some area, have some opinions about that, you try to confirm your own opinion through the human factor while um, you may be looking in the wrong direction. There's also very misleading ways to present data that can actually fool you or fool other people. So uh, yeah, Vatican City has like 2.27 popes per square kilometer, which is a correct result, but totally yeah, bad, mm, yeah, misleading. Um, if you use a sampling profile, and not profiling like every instance, but do like regular sampling, you can have like sampling errors. Uh, uh, Nicholas Channon theorem is a uh, fun thing if you're working with images or any kind of other sampling or any kind of electronics. And there are multiple papers on the topic. I uh, love that one, it's very fun to read. Producing run data without doing anything obviously wrong. This is a very fun paper that claims like stuff that went wrong because people were looking the wrong way. And computers are very, very noisy. So this is uh, one second of my laptop doing nothing. And there's, well, well, lots of going on, although it's doing actually nothing in the background. So CPUs, power states, etc. So Victor Stinner's blog explains how you have to configure and reboot and set up your kernel and operating system to make sure that you remove some of the noise for some of the CPUs and get like rid of RDQ handlers or balancers or whatever. Other things is we had a very fun back a while ago where depending on your environment, how the length of like your host name or how much environment variables you have in your system changes the way how memory is allocated. And if you go th over th threshold, then you may suddenly go from just a couple of um, memap calls to a lot of mem uh, m mapping and unmapping of uh, memory of uh, pages uh, that can change your performance a lot. It just took us ages to figure that out. So let's profile. Um, very easy case. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to show is reading a file. And the simple thing you can do in Python is just to take the time, do something, take the time again. Well, there are multiple issues with that kind of approach. Uh, you're missing a fun talk and the other slug like what uh, a day has 24 hours plus minus one. 
or if you have time zone switches, if you have like a clock source that's changing, you have to use a clock source to do profiling that does not change on your uh, surroundings. So there, this clock source I'm using here would be a bad one. So if I do profiling like on uh, DST switch, you get like, takes an hour extra or I get negative results for that. So it's one of the caveats you should uh, mention, uh, should uh, take care of. So some of the examples I'm using next one is just a very simple shell uh, thing, just doing cat uh, things. I'm using uh, Python to open read from a file. And some of the more advanced uh, things, I'm using HTTPS connection with requests, because requests uh, is a tool that most of you know. Uh, it does a lot of things. So it does like network operations, file operations. It does something with SSL, open SSL, TLS encryption, and a couple of other things. So it's, uh, shows lots of different areas where you can get very uh, surprising results. So, section one, ptrace. ptrace is a very old um, feature from the old Unix days, so in about 1985. It's a way to, ex um, to do user space tracing and um, it's used by lots of tooling, you may know. So if you use the GNU debugger to debug a C program, if you use S-trace, L-trace, if you do uh, uh, code coverage of any kind of C library, uh, low-level libraries, you will use ptrace more like. And ptrace is useful but slow, and useful in the sense it's mostly easy to use. So one example here is I'm using L-trace, that's the library called Tracer, uh, to see, is it big enough? Oh, perfect. Uh, to see what, if I do requests, uh, I want to see are uh, all variables or all function calls starting with SSL, CTX, something at any library that's loaded. So that's the at sign, after that is the library. Um, that shows me the different function calls I'm getting, which libraries is there, so the Python SSL module, the internal dash SSL, uh, underscore SSL, and there are a couple of calls to see which memory addresses are called and the results, uh, return result on the right side. Not very helpful, but still you can see if, for example, I want to investigate if your program is calling a specific function at all. It's rather nice for that. You can also do something like um, count how many memory allocations you do. Uh, so I'm uh, running two processes and two different shells. So I get the pit. Then I use ltrace to trace malloc, realloc, and free at any library. I attach to that pit. I run um, requests call, and I get like how many allocations I get, and free calls I get. But one uh, downside from ptrace is it's slow. So that one took instead of like half a second on a very slow social network, like three and a bit of four seconds. So the overhead is extremely high because it, Altrice has to uh, jump back and forth between kernel space and user space a lot. A uh, similar tool uh, is the tool S-Trace, where you can investigate system calls, and developed by uh, Paul Kranburg in 1991, and now maintained by Dimitri Levin. And so the logo of uh, S-Trace is an ostrich. Why an ostrich? Well, if you know Dutch or maybe German, it, uh, Strauss is the name of the bird. So in German or in uh, uh, Netherlands, he eats Dutch. Uh, so that's Strauss. And with S-Trace, you do system call tracing. So what's, uh, what's uh, system call tracing? Oh. Does it load? No, it doesn't load. Oh, is it back in my, my uh, she. OK, uh, that's supposed to be a circle of the different rings of a CPU. You see a bit of the circle that's so round. Uh, because a way how modern operating systems work is that uh, all processes run in user space. And user space is not allowed to directly do anything with hardware, even like memories uh, virtualized, uh, access to any kind of hardware calls are uh, um, abstracted by the kernel. You have to tell the kernel, please open that file for me, or please do something, send something for me on the network device. And this is a, a done by a syscall. So you call a feature in the kernel, the kernel does some verification, and then talks for you to the operating system and goes back. And this is called a syscall, and any time you do a syscall, you have to do a context switch. So the kernel has to save the user space state, set up his kernel space state uh, on the CPU, do something, and 
go back, and that takes a lot of time, which you can't see in here. Well, it worked yesterday. So, stressing, uh, like you, one thing is make open a file. So you wanna like catch this Etsy host uh, release file and see uh, which files are actually open by cat in that way. And you see like um, nothing. Well, that's bad. It's strange, we're tracing open, but open is the system called to open a file, still is no result. It's peculiar. So let's just look for all so it's called made, and you see, oh, it doesn't call open, it calls something called open at, or open at. So the kernel does not have just one syscall for specific tasks, it open a, like a family of syscalls to do related things, and GPC decided to move away from the old open syscall, because not available on all operating systems and CPU architectures, but used open at a while ago. So one thing, if you want to stress like open calls, is to use like this regular expression, or even easier, um, they're like um, uh, multiple families of things I will explain in a minute. Um, and this approach also with the regular expression is a bit bad if you do like stat, stat call like get status of a file like file size and permission, they are like a plentitude of different syscalls which may or may not be available or may or may not give you the correct results. And GDPC does the correct thing but you need to actually track them all. So easier way to do that comes next but first um, first look at how this trace open at call works. So if it, I open at trace that, you see like multiple calls, and the result on the right side is the low-level file descriptor, which is in this example always three because um, the program opens the file, reads something, closes it, and then the kernel reuses the same file descriptor number. Um, or I can do something else, and rather new feature is dash capital P to trace all activity on one file. You see it's doing, it's actually doing a redirect because it's a symlink, and then do some stat calls, read something, and finally closes the file. So this is a rather nifty tool to see uh, what operations a process does. Um, again, there are multiple helper classes, so if you want anything with a file, you can use a uh, person file percent uh, desk is anything with a file descriptor, there's really sockets and file operations. Network uh, operation have different family class you can help, and there are uh, other multiple helpers to get like more output and have tr trace give you a more detailed analysis of what's going on. For example, uh, tracing all file access uh, by running a program. Uh, this is a, a request call that tries to load some CA certs on a present, so I use that feature a lot to investigate why something doesn't work, although I expect that that's one the configuration mistake I had in one of my systems. Uh, another thing is to uh, uh, see network activity. Uh, so if you do like a network call, the first thing you always do is the DNS look up. You see it's, uh, it's open a socket to INET DGRAM, that's UDP socket, does something on port 43, uh, 53, uh, looks for Python, and then gets back an IP address, and then next one it connects to that IP address and does a request. And uh, with the right options, you see actually what's going on in the internal data structures. So it's, this tracing tool is also a nice way to learn more about how operating systems and uh, GDPC and kernel works. A cool feature for any kind of tester is something called syscall tampering. You can actually modify and play around and disturb how syscalls work. For example, uh, I inject a, um, an error into the socket syscall. It opens a new socket and say, okay, EM file is not, uh, is a error number, uh, so an error uh, on a pit and do something and if I do a request then, okay, DNS lookup doesn't work because the first socket call doing a DNS lock is just intercepted and get an error. I can also do something like, okay, I don't want to just intercept the first one, I want to intercept the second and any following one. So that's the uh, when equals uh, two plus. And now the DNS lookup works, but the first connection fails because uh, I can't open a file. There's uh, too many open file descriptors. That's the EM file error number. Or uh, Perhaps you want to slow down like some operations, reading, writing to a file, slow down some kind of network operations. You can do something uh, to slow that down with strace uh, 2. You can add a delay, either in the beginning or in the exit of a uh, system call. And that slows down like copying from uh, def0 to def null from 3.2 G 
gigabytes a second to just about 10 megabytes a second, just by slowing it down a bit. Um, other thing is, for example, you want to analyze a program that removes temp files, so let's uh, just disable the unlink call. Unlink is the internal name to remove a name from a file descriptor, uh, from, from a file handle on, on disk, so that's remove um, in Unix speak. And yeah, so you see that it's injected, and the file is still there, uh, but the program doesn't get an error on it. So it doesn't fail from the perspective of the program, but it doesn't do anything. So it's just return volume zero. And yeah, pause is still there. So um, verdict, I'll use L Ltrace, especially strace a lot because it's easy to use for small, simple tasks. It's powerful and usually does need only extra privileges, but on the other hand, it's slow. And especially Ltrace does not work with any kind of modern binaries when they're uh, compiled with special flags. So if you have a bind now thing, then there's missing some information in the header and Ltrace can no longer analyze and see what's happening. So there was high level tracing. It's go a bit lower to actually to see what's my operating system doing? What's my kernel doing? What's my hardware doing? There are several tracing capabilities inside the kernel for different kind of tasks. Um, so a lot of the tracing is, for example, the kernel tracing. You can see what the file system is doing, what your hardware drivers are doing. Uh, the CPU tracing capabilities, you can see what your CPU cache is doing, what your memory management unit is doing, handling memory. Um, or there's also a way to do user space tracing from the kernel space. Uh, so ptrace is very slow because ptrace, ha anytime you do something, has to copy the values back to user space and copy it back and copy lots of data. With efficient user space tracing in kernel space, uh, you can do lots of pre-filtering in the kernel, store it in an efficient ring buffer, and then have another process extract the ring buffer uh, with the pre-filtered or pre-aggregated results to a file. That's very, very efficient. Different, uh, and yeah. What I mentioned before, uh, it's a fun way to learn more about how actually the kernel works. Different data sources are uh, kernel probes and user space probes, K probes, U, U probes. Uh, different event handlers, uh, the kernel defines several events, CPU has several events, some kind of chips on your uh, motherboard made emit events that are handled by the kernel and offered to you. And there are different kind of user space things. Uh, uh, USDT, I will explain later on with some examples in Python. Uh, Python, yeah. Um, K probes, U probes. Uh, with kernel probes, you can see almost everything happening inside the kernel. And with user space, also almost everything. Well, things you can't uh, inject or um, intercept is anything that's statically, internally optimized C function or um, internalized C functions. They are optimized away by the compiler and they're no longer available, but the rest, yeah. And performance uh, counter, this is a small, small, small uh, part of which kind of performance counters you actually have. I think the page is usually like, what, like 20 pages or so on my screen, I have a big screen, so it's a lot. So something you can do is like, um, yeah, these are almost 1,900 different events I have on my system. So, and kernel trace events you can see is here, for example, I'm uh, listening to uh, CHG 80211, that's the standard for uh, wireless network cards, and I get the uh, base station um, uh, frames and bet, uh, get base station um, packages, so I see what my wireless network card is doing when connecting to a new base station. And you see different frequencies, you see activities, you see that in the end it's connecting to uh, the physical hardware to band one on frequency 5180 and the MAC number and other stuff. And these are uh, two of the events you can see. If you want to know what your system is doing, fun tool. So the advanced tools, uh, I'm going the, I mentioned, I will not cover all of these tools. I'm calling quite quickly uh, ftrace because ftrace is the foundation lot of the other tooling using a function tracing in the kernel. Uh, the perf tool to handle perf events. Uh, BCC and extended uh, Berkeley package filter language tools 
are a new way to write kernel programs. Um, these days, a kernel has a virtual machine with a JIT that you can run eBPF programs in. Uh, system tab, uh, the last tool I'll explain, and there's several more tools, so uh, like um, LTTNG, uh, which is a cool tool developed by the University of Montreal. Um, D-Trace and system tab. So if you look into the Python documentation on the instrumentation, um, system tab is one way to do D-Tracing on Linux of original developer Sun. F-Trace is the function tracer. You can do function tracing on a system that just has a kernel and a busy box because you only need uh, uh, very low level shell commands to do that. Uh, and the rest you can do with a virtual uh, file system. So just one example is uh, I had one issue on one system that stored data on FS. I wanted to see uh, which kind of kernel it calls. Um, it just a simple Python program does it opens the file and reads something. And you see, right now I have a function graph uh, attached to any kind of NFS kernel function. This is the call stack inside the kernel, what the kernel does to read something from NFS store. Or a different representation is I want to see, uh, because I, I noticed that getting permissions from NFS was very slow. So give me anything NFS permission related and give me the call stack of that. And you see here, it does actually two different open calls. Uh, first, it does a check using newstat and something. And uh, the second one, it just opens the actual file. See, at the end, this do this open or is this call uh, 64. That's the entry point where the user space calls into kernel space. And then the kernel space does permission checks if you actually allow to open the file. Um, the issue we are having here is that the metadata cache for permissions had some issues and didn't cache uh, the permissions the correct way. Perf counting on Linux, uh, as I mentioned before, um, different ways to do that. In most cases, you can do that as an unprivileged user. And you can also, the tooling has high level tooling to look into Python and Java, Node.js and PHP and whatever else you're using. Um, one thing, uh, it's very fun. So what does my CPU do when I compile CPython on my system? So uh, here using perf, getting stats and calling the command make-j. Uh, so do parallel uh, builds of CPython. And you see like how many context switches I got, how many CPU instructions it took to compile CPython on my laptop, uh, how often the level one, level two cache was utilized. Um, very nice way to see if your algorithm, so if you're into data science, you want to have an algorithm that uses the CPU caches very efficiently. If you see you have some of issue there, well, or uh, how good compiling CPython uses the uh, turbo utilization. So these days, um, computers, CPUs have turbo boost. Uh, that allows you to basically handle one physical uh, CPU cores to virtual CPU cores. And uh, in theory, you can a utilization of two, which would, be, would mean that both cores, virtual cores would be perfectly used. 1.7 is a very good ratio. So there are a lot of ways to do that. You can also do uh, user space probing. Uh, so I used a while ago the example L-Trace. Uh, the perf looks a bit different. First, you have to define your probing points, which you want to get. And then you can get statistics about that, how often uh, the different syscalls are called. And so um, the plain one without any tracing took uh, my slow hotel network like a bit more than half a second. The L-Trace variant, uh, almost 3.5 three or four seconds, and with uh, perf, it's just a bit slower, no, a bit more than one millisecond slower than the original one, so that's much more efficient. And there, uh, to get like perf results, um, I'll use now another approach to get a call graph uh, from a requests call. So first you have to record what you're doing, then you have to do reporting annotating, and finally you can pivot through a script and create something called a flame graph, the, the graph I showed before. And if you do that uh, first calling Python, you get something like that, which is a bit hard to read. And it also, it contains both 
things happening in requests, but also all the operations happening uh, while starting Python, shutting Python down. It's only counting um, user space time, so it doesn't not see any time that happens in kernel space, uh, like doing network transactions. So we want to look closer, just want to know what requests does internally. Uh, using the similar approach as before, getting the PID, uh, running perf on that PID, just do the one request, then I control, uh, press control C, stop that, do the plane graph, now you see that graph. Uh, here again, the box. If you look at the very low, you see something called X509 store load locations. So that call is wasting almost 40% locating, loading, and parsing the root CA cert to validate requests. So if you do SSL connection, you have to load like root CAs, trust anchors, and that loading takes very, very long time because uh, it does a lot of internal operations. And if you do requests.get in a loop, you always have to do the same operations. Load CA certs from the uh, disk, do some operations, put it into special memory structures, validate them, et cetera, et cetera. So the correct way is use a session or reuse SSL context to load only the root states one time, and you're fine. It was something I just figured out uh, like a week ago when I uh, updated the slides from uh, using PHP examples, used curl and PHP, my uh, original slides from the web developer conference to Python. Yep. Other advanced tools um, to look deeper into the kernel and a bit easier to use than doing raw function tracing as the BCC compiler collection, which I like a lot. It's a way to write something Python mixed with C code, which will then generate uh, eBPF programs and upload them into your kernel and do some kind of operations. And this BCC collection is a collection of a lot of, lot of tools. This is a slightly older uh, explanation, a listing of different tools. And you s uh, so the things you see around, except for the C, Java, Node, PHP, Python, Ruby thing, these are all tools that are already available and ready to use in the examples directory of BCC. For example, uh, one tool is uh, X4SF slow operations tool, which uh, shows you which um, processes on your computer take a lot of time doing something on the X4 file system. So this is, uh, um, for me, Bash does something. So it's a Balo control using KDE. Balo CTL is like the index database that indexes files on your file system. And there's also uh, mod storage that's part of Mozilla Firefox to store cookies and yeah. So these are some processes that take a lot of time on my X4 file system, my home directory or um, get TCP connections, but filter them by user. So with TCP dump, you can just get all TCP connections, but you don't see the user ID. And this TCP connect program can filter connections like by user ID or other things that are available in the kernel space, not, but not available to tools like TCP dump. Or, well, how about we break all SSL encryption with SSL sniff? Uh, using request call, uh, using accept encoding identity, because I don't want to have like gzip compression, compression, it makes it hard to read, and run the program, and well, I get like clear text results. So that one uses user space probes to hook into OpenSSL before SSL write encrypt stator or after SSL read decrypt stator. Just and then it dumps all the traffic, and that works for all processes on the computer. So that. Um, that one only attaches to one pit, but in theory you could run it at the root on, a, on a, your system, it will dump all TLS SSL encrypted traffic to a file. Or how about you wanna see which files are open? So you can run that small script, this BPF trace, and to uh, and accept all this enter open AT calls and just dump the command name, the PID, and the file open. It just will print lots of lots of output on your, on your screen all file activity on your computer. Or how about you wanna know uh, how memory allocations are handled? So this is a, a histogram of all uh, sizes of memory allocations for requests call. Um, so you see on the left side the ranges, so one byte or two to four bytes uh, allocated like 661 times, et cetera, et cetera. And well, these are very cool tools to 
just a look very quickly into your process so you give you the idea of what may go wrong. Um, the most powerful tool I currently know of is SystemTap. Um, SystemTap is a way to write kernel models that does system interception and profiling, and including using a user space defined um, probes. So USDTs um, are a way where a program can tell system tab where there's something that could be intercepted or done. So Python offers multiple uh, user space probes like function entry, function return, uh, GCC done to see what the garbage collector is doing, imports or different line activities. And the last one I added for 3.8 is uh, for auditing hooks. Uh, PHP has even more um, ones. And if you look into Java, they're going a bit overboard, 521, the time I wrote the initial version of that talk like half a year ago, probably more now. And if you do um, tracing with a system tab or S tab command, they say one problem, um, so I keep my laptop very secure, and which kind of uh, prohibited me from using system tab, because system tab creates a kernel module and tries to load it into the kernel. But if you run your kernel securely with secure boot, then you're not allowed to inject any uh, random unsigned kernel models. So the first thing you have to do is well, reboot your computer and uh, disable secure boot or figure out how to do kernel signing on your laptop with a uh, mock key. So let's trace Python. Let's see how you can you write your first STEP program to trace what's happening inside Python. So we have to define a probe bind, attach the probe bind to a process, which is actually not a, necessarily a process name, maybe sometimes a library name. And then we use a marker, uh, and the marker is always double underscore thunder for some reasons, although the entry point has a single under. So um, it gets multiple arguments. The first one is actually a string pointer. So you have to use user string to convert the model name. I'm getting like the current time, using the current time and the uh, thread identifier to store them in a kind of hash map. And then I print out some stuff and incre incrementing the depth. And the other way around, so I have the second one that goes on uh, find load done, which gets uh, the model name, but also information was the import successful or not. Keeping the time and printing some stuff and just to run your first um, STEP program, I need root permissions to inject the kernel model for good reasons. So uh, I'm using the import STEP program and run this Python pa pass. And you see the different imports, including uh, nested imports. So you see like the encodings model loads codex or the site model tries to load site customized, user customized, and the timestamps and when it's done. So, and um, they talked yesterday about gil or no gil. Um, Harry, I think he sits over there somewhere. Uh, he uh, added additional user space probes, USDTs, to investigate when the gil is allocated or gil is acquired, released, or when somebody tries to get the gil. And this is something I may add to actually the next version of Python. You can see when there's any kind of congestion on uh, the jill. It's a cool thing. So, verdict, kernel space, loser space tracing, uh, tracing, sorry. Um, I think you can get a lot of detailed information, which is also one of the issues. You get so much information, you may get overwhelmed. It's very fast, uh, mostly efficient. So the overhead is like, in the, like 10%, 15%, 20%, depending what you're doing. Uh, you can get extremely detailed information in what your hardware or software is doing. Uh, there's a wide variety of already pre-built tooling, but yeah. The learning curve can be very steep. I've been playing around with that for a year now, still not very good at it, and yeah. And also, if you do it the wrong way, so if you do something like enable dumping all call stacks for all kernel functions, you turn your big server into a very, very slow computer or even slower than that one. Uh, yeah. So in my own opinion, and this is actually, I watched Swiss Army Knife before I knew they were going to EuroPython, so that's from my first version. Uh, so S-Trace and the BPF-Trace are very tool, nice tools, very 
quick hacks and quick approaches. BCC is very cool if you can use the pre-built tools. Uh, for writing new tools, it's not that hard. You need to know a bit of Python, a bit of C, because if you, the mix is very wild. You use like Jinja templates with C code inside Python code to do something, generate new code. So it's a bit like Cython, but for kernel models. Uh, Perf is uh, great if you want to go very, very low level. I don't have, I may have time to show you a video what we did in CPython to investigate an issue uh, in the long add operation to add two numbers. I think it's still enough time. Um, system tab um, is very interesting uh, if you use like user space defined probing. Um, and this cooling approach to replace some of the C code with actually VPPF code. So then you no longer have to run scary kernel models inside your kernel and just run EPPF program inside the JIT of the kernel. It's a bit more saner and safer. Um, F-Trace is uh, useful either if you're just booting up the system that no, has no user space tooling yet or for all the kernels. And again, EPPF is really the future. You want to learn more? Uh, Brandon Gregg's website is just the beginning of everything related to tracing. He's just fantastic. Uh, EBPF and IEO supervisor project. Um, there are multiple um, books on system tab that are really great. Um, there is a there has been a talk on PyBase 16 by Eben Freeman who got into more details how to extract like stack traces in Python from kernel space and uh, getting a bit more deeper on that topic. And can take like three minutes of questions and I, while taking questions, I'll just show you the video that, okay, I think it just, uh, where's my mouse cursor? So this, I'm compiling Python, running a perf on that and going deep into like which CPU instructions are executed. So run and anybody, any questions? Any questions? Anybody has any questions? Thank you, Christian. <laughs> any questions, please come to the microphones in front. Okay, no questions. Oh, there's somebody coming. Okay, no perfect, question. hello. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, so when I was using native code, it was very interesting to use S trace and similar tools, but for interpreted languages, I thought it was a bit more difficult because it's, um, you see all the code which the interpreter is actually doing, and I found it hard to actually associate my code with the traces. Yes, that's one issue if you cross language boundaries, like from native C code or native code on, on to interpreted code or between, I used to do like Java and Python mix up on the same process, or .NET and Python on the same process, it get harder. So there are ways to extract like stack traces, uh, back traces of calls using this tooling. So GDB uh, has a lot of very elaborate scripting to extract information. And this is something like a, a call to action. If you're interested to do more system tab, uh, the, uh, even Freeman, yeah, even Freeman, uh, he uh, wrote already some proof of concept tooling, and um, Instagram, Facebook, uh, they are the ones that usually contributed the first implementation calls to uh, Python, and they have some tooling, uh, but they're not yet open sourced. Uh, I hope that I can convince somebody at Instagram that it may be released some of the tooling which they use to uh, optimize the Instagram web services. We're working on Python 3.7, I think. That would be cool. Again, yeah, it's a big issue. I, that's why you um, need extra work on that. I agree. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so one very quick question, maybe? Okay, hi. Uh, can we mm, use these tools in Docker environment, and can we prepare the Docker environment to trigger them remotely, for example? Docker, so yes and no. You, if you're able to, depending on which tools you have, so s should work if you don't need to ex, uh, attach it to a different PID. Some of the other tooling, like you probably don't want to allow your Docker daemon to modify your kernel. Uh, it, so, but you, if you uh, have access to the base system, so the system that runs your container environment, you can run there as a privileged user 
because containers are just processes in a different namespace on the same computer. That would work. So like the low-level kernel tracing tools, probably not for security reasons. Uh, uh, um, Docker or any other container platform restricts syscalls, especially the ptrace, attach, and kernel loading um, syscalls. But again, if you use the base system, that would work. OK. OK, thanks. You're welcome. If you have any more questions, uh, I will be here. We like We have, yeah, okay. sorry. Any end of the week. So. Yeah. Um, so thank you again.